perfect. So we're at Fawcett's Toy Museum up on Route 1 in Waldeboro, the northern end of Route 1 in Waldeboro. John Fawcett has got a collection of... Unbelievable. 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 Um, so anyway... We're so listening to Gene Autry there, which is Mike's mother's first love. Right. Everything's coming back. Right, right. So Mike's <laughs> in tears right now. But anyway, John, John bought... This was the old Aunt Lydia's, right, John? It was uh, purchased in 96 by you and your wife. Yep. And so anyway... And it was run down, and he put all this back It together. looks great. Oh, I mean, the building's in great shape. Uh, it was in disrepair. And then you started filling up this place. I mean, uh, yeah. but tell tell the viewers, tell them it's a museum and the store. Tell the viewers at the age of four, John was in Watertown, Massachusetts. He ever since he could pick up a paper, a pencil and paper, he could draw, right? And yeah. then comic books got you going. Dell, Pop Dell comics. Uh, I um. I'm one of those guys who, as an artist, I was looking for research material back in the 1960s. Pop art was starting to happen. And there was very little information at the library, so what I would do is I started collecting. And this is basically my wallpaper, in mm -hmm. that I use this material in my artwork. And it's not about nostalgia for me, it's about aesthetics. I'm in here because uh -huh. I like the quality of the artwork that's involved. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to be eight years old again. I can't be eight years old mm -hmm. again. Well, I, I read that you made your first comic when you were six, and your yeah, well, aunt, that, your aunt one sewed in, it together for you. Yeah, it was on cloth or yeah, something. Yeah, there's one right up there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in the other room. Anyway, there's a lot uh -huh. of stuff to see. Um, <laughs> We're open mm -hmm. from uh, 10 to 4, Monday, uh, essentially, when we're shut, always shut on Tuesday and Wednesdays. I tell people, if you're coming for the museum, bring your parents and your grandparents. Right. Mm -hmm. They're going to appreciate it. Yeah, they will. They'll yeah. probably appreciate it more. Yeah, they appreciate it more, and they generally I find that kids don't know what they're looking at. Right. If they know who the Lone Ranger is, they'll have right. a good time. So it's, so it's open this weekend, Memorial Day weekend, and we're going to try to put a dent in this. So anyway, we're going to be walking around here, and John's going to give us a private tour. I feel very privileged, and uh, I hope you enjoy Actually, it. You, you move three feet, and John's got a million things to tell us about. So what do we got here? Mike's shooting that little doll. Right? What's These that, Mike? Are, um, down here are 1930s dwarfs? Disney games. Sure, Seven Dwarfs. And, um, dopey. Yeah, that's Dopey from the Seven Dwarfs. This mm -hmm. one is Pinocchio, and those are games. Yeah. This is a... World War I uh, press steel ambulance, which is done by Keystone, is really quite rare. Oh my god. Up here is original comic strip art. This is a Sunday page drawn by Harrison Caddy in 1921. He's the Peter Rabbit artist and did all the work for the Thornton Burgess, Mother West Wind, Peter Rabbit books. Mm -hmm. This is the first Sunday page. This is original art. These aren't prints, they're not posters. Look at the real things done by the artist. And this is the first page for the uh, Cinderella comic strip by Disney. Yeah, you got a... Okay. You got you got a Brooklyn bum over there, yeah, don't you? When the uh, Dodgers are back in town. That to be one of uh, my paintings that I did. Oh, you did uh, that! Wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. of got, the Brooklyn Dodgers. Over here. Jackie Robinson and Gil Hodges. Yeah. I can't see that other guy. But, yeah. yeah. Um, up here are some Big Little books and some Wizard of Oz books, the original ones. Wow. And now we got Hopalong Cassidy. Yeah. Uh, up here on, on the, the cover of Time yet? Wow. Yeah. Hopalong Cassidy was. And life. It's yeah. from Maine. And, and luck. All the Hoplon Cassidy stories were written in Freiburg, Maine by Clarence Mulford. Oh, and way out west of You Freiburg. heard it here, folks, on What's Up. <laughs> Hoplon Cassidy's from Maine. That's right. The original, not right. the guys that are walking around limping in this if you If you go over to uh, Freiburg and go to the library, they're supposed to have an exhibit of some of the Hoplon Cassidy books over there. Mm -hmm. And Clarence Mulford was not happy with this guy playing him on TV and on the in the movies because... He was totally different from his character. His character smoked and swore and mm -hmm. walked with a limp because he was shot in the leg. And yeah, he is was, from Maine, isn't he? And this yeah, guy was sounds good right. Two shoes up in here. Yeah. Right. So and Doug clams when he wasn't riding. This is a store display of Roy Rogers cat pistols. There's an original uh, animation cell from the three Disney three oh, Caballeros. Right. This is a piece of my own artwork right. in the background here. This assemblage shows all about World War II. Mm. 
And then down John in... John is no slouch, by the way. He taught art at University of Connecticut for stores 32 for years. 32 years yeah. as an art teacher. So this and knowledge... Don't your awards. Th this this <laughs> knowledge didn't happen last week. Yeah. So best anyway. teacher in the art department and finally best teacher at the university. How's what do we got in the case here, well, John? Yeah, down up here are some Britain's toy soldiers. <laughs> These are Tunaville trolleys. This is a wonderful <laughs> Marx tin <laughs> wind-up toy down here. <laughs> I think this is really pretty and it's quite unusual. It's a, a Victorian era fretwork bus that's all cut out of wood by oh, hand with wow. a little coping saw. I wonder where the bus <laughs> Look at the stairway in the back of it. I wonder where that bus ran, you know? Don't know. Uh, it, was, hey. it was England anyway wow. where it was done. Hey Mike, here's your first love. <laughs> Betty Boop. <laughs> the Be Betty Boop doll. This is, a, this is a piece of folk art. Somebody made this Mickey. I don't know who. I don't mm -hmm. know when, but it's a 1930s image Mickey. The Donald is from about 1936 when he had a long bill and yeah. the Snow White yeah. piece here, his Snow White bread, mm -hmm. that's again 1937 or so. Well, we're going to take a walk another three feet yeah. and have yeah. a, a right. pile of information for you. Yeah, yeah. good yeah. stuff. All right, I just had one question. Now we're in another room. We've moved maybe four feet, right, Kit? I'm and, uh, so anyway, I just wanted to ask John real quick when he was going to start collecting Mickey Mouses. I mean, this is just one case. And uh, so anyway, where, where, do, all, where are these? Where, where do they all come from? Yeah, where do they come from, John? Uh, they come basically from yard sales, tag sales, antique shows, and so forth. These, on this shelf here are bis figurines from the 1930s. And my dad used to buy me some of these occasionally walking around. There were toothbrush holders in here, and I can remember getting one of those when I was a kid. Um, I grew up before television. I'm one of those guys who yeah. uh, went into a movie theater and you have a big darkened movie screen and there's magical moving drawings on the screen going up in front of you. And we'd go up and draw what artists, visual people like myself, we'd go home and draw what we saw in order to save the experience. Yeah. Disney in the beginning was all about art. He was not making movies for kids. He was doing general entertainment stuff. And this was a worldwide phenomenon. Like, for example, this is a car hood ornament here from England, made by the Desmo Company in the 1930s. In the early Mickeys, what you want to look for is a mouse with a circular form, circular forms all the way through, white yeah, face, yeah, yeah, oval yeah. eyes, pie cut shapes out of the eyes. It's just circles. Yeah, and, uh, and the uh, copyright would be by Walt Disney Enterprises. Mm -hmm. These are banks down here from France in 1932. Hmm. And these are the beautiful radios from the 1930s, made by the Emerson Radio Company. Hmm. And this is a very famous Mickey Mouse toy. This is a Lionel uh, Mickey Mouse hand car. Back in 1936, Lionel toy trains were going out of business, mm -hmm. and they got a contract with Disney, and then they sold millions of those in the original box for a dollar a piece in the Depression. That was the day's pay mm -hmm. in 1936. Mm -hmm. Because of that mm. toy, that's why Lionel trains are still around. It was that made by Lionel? Oh, yeah. 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 You, you know who would be interested in that? Neil Young. Okay. Neil Young owns right. Lionel He's Train got Company. Lionel's and he right. knows what to do with. So we're going to take a walk. We're going to just back up a little bit, and uh, there's nothing really to see over here except no. for what do we got? We got Gene Autry. Gene Autry Salad. Yeah. Saddle. Saddle. Yeah. Uh, horse Champion. Wasn't that his name? Yeah, that was his horse, right? Yeah. This He's is um, Gene Autry's rodeo saddle. His behind has been in this saddle, and. Uh, there were actually 10 of these given to the uh, Cowboy Hall of Fame, and they wound up selling the saddles. And so one of them wound up here in Waldebro, Maine. <laughs> um, up here, this is the Lone Ranger uh, movie serial from 1938. That's the title poster, which is quite rare. And this is Roy Rogers, I think his best one-sheet movie poster. This one was done in um, 1943 for the Red River Valley. Beautiful color, great drawing. Beautiful. Gabby Hayes, Gabby Hayes Dale Evans, magnificent all our old friends there. there. What's the Lone Ranger got on his face there? I don't remember anything but a mask. <laughs> That's the movie serial Lone Ranger mask. He had this black point on the top up here and then had this netting then, going down below. Were they filming? Were there yeah. a lot of black flies, do you think? <laughs> Could have been. <laughs> no, we got wet net. One of the rooms we're going to go into, the Long Ranger actually started on radio. Yeah. I wouldn't yeah. remember because I'm too young, but you guys the might be able to remember. Yeah, right. And so anyway, the uh, Seven, a, the guy 7:30 at night he came on. The guy the guy <laughs> actually wore a hat and the mask on the radio That's and right. kids said you got to get in the mood, right? Yeah, so anyway, we'll there. see that. Absolutely. That's over in the other <laughs> another room, but what else we got here real quick, John? We got some toys up yeah, there. How does how does ET fit in with all these western uh, heroes? 
It was a. It was just one of those things that I bought. You know. <laughs> when are we gonna put this one? <laughs> spur of the moment, inspirational piece over here. Yeah. This, this was a, a company that made exact copies of a lot of the movie characters, and they put them out in limited editions. Mm. And then they went out of business, and so I was able to get that for half the price of what they were asking. So okay. What's the year of that Jack in the Box up there, John? This one, that's yeah. about 1946 or so. It's all made of wood in a composition figure up here, but it's made by the Spear Company. Right. And there's model craft set. I used to make these. Uh, I used to make these plaster Paris figures when I went to the YMCA and you know as a kid and paint them. And those survived because I managed to give those to my uh, aunt when I was a kid. Thank God John had parents that didn't throw anything away. Oh, God, they wow, threw yeah. anything. <laughs> well, why don't you tell me about, uh, tell these people about what happened to your Scarlet Fever comic oh, collection. Huh? Anyway, uh, <laughs> my mother, bless her soul, right? Sure. She, uh, she had a friend, her name, Edith Payne, and she had a uh, son named, Edith had a son named Tony, and he was sick in bed. And my mother thought it would be a very nice thing to give all my comic books from the 1940s to Tony Payne so we'd have something to read while he was sick. Mm. Well, guess what? Tony Payne got, had scarlet fever. And I saw him walking down the street about, oh, I don't know, a month or so later. I said, Tony, where's all my comic books? He says, oh, they had to be burned. I had scarlet fever. So everything went away. The only ones that survived from my childhood <laughs> are the Classics Illustrated comics that I used to do the book reports in mm -hmm. school. <laughs> and we'll so see those. He didn't uh, want to read those. No. <laughs> okay, okay, so we're going to go in one more. I got, more, one, I got one, one, one more question here. Yeah. you got a Mickey Mouse, which we can't get on film, unfortunately. He's got teeth. Oh, yeah. I've mm -hmm. never seen Mickey, Mickey Mouse with Mickey teeth. Mickey Mouse with teeth is actually fairly common. Really? Um, <laughs> And it, Are they teeth or dentures, John? <laughs> <laughs> They're teeth. Uh, in fact, there are some Mickey Mouse in here, way in the back row, very hard to see. Mm -hmm. but, oh, yeah. And look up here. These are a little easier to oh, see. Oh, yeah. yeah. Those, those, are, those, dolls. those are Dean's Ragbook dolls. And Dean's okay. Ragbook was the English company, and they made them with the teeth and the big <laughs> smile on there. Mm -hmm. Look at this guy. You want to see something really strange with teeth? That is a jar from France, about 1932, 33. Look at the teeth on that guy. Now, John, do you ever go out with, grab a few pieces of material and go out and do lectures? Do you ever go to, um, you know, maybe speak somewhere? Mm -hmm. We're gonna, I'm gonna be your agent, so we're gonna book you. We're gonna book book you into the Rotary clubs and all that. So anyway, uh, uh, I'm a geezer. I fall asleep uh, too early to work right. at night. Let's go into another room. Now we got the. What's the next room we call the Roy? Oh, we call it the. Uh, we can go to the Lone Ranger. Lone, Lone Ranger, Ranger room. room. Remember the Lone Ranger? Yeah. Sure. Uh, you might want to pick up if you want to get something interesting. This is the Lone Ranger shirt and boots in here. The real thing. Okay. So if you want to pick All right. Up, I think if you, I'll just do this solo. You've got, you've got, uh, you got your shirt. All right. So we didn't even, we didn't even make it to the Long Ranger room. Hey, we now we're passing the Long Ranger's boots, shirt. Is that a gun there, That's John? Gun. Right. And then down below, which is really pretty interesting, those are some Betty Boop dolls from 1932. Uh, on get left, your camera off those now. Come on. Mm -hmm. On the left hand side there, that's your dog Bimbo. Mm -hmm. That's where the term comes from when you call somebody really? Bimbo. Bimbo. Yeah, really, I've never used that term yeah, myself, yeah, but <laughs> yeah. So a lot of these words were invented, yeah. and the other word you said in the Jeep. other room Jeep. was we'll Jeep. Get to that. We'll, we'll get, get to that. that. Yeah. The word Jeep was invented yeah. in the other room. Yeah. Yeah. A fiery okay. horse with a speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty hello, Silver, the Lone Ranger, with his faithful Indian companion Tonto. The daring and resourceful masked rider of the plains led the fight for law and order in the early West. Return with us now to those days of yesteryear. The Lone yeah, Ranger sure rides well, again. That. Yeah. that was Fred Foy on the original radio program. Just to let you know, we're not running out of Long Ranger stuff. This is a whole case, pretty much Long Ranger stuff. And what was that? What was that sound again, Kit? Hello, Silver. Who was that masked man? <laughs> and it wasn't Tonto. No, no, poor Tonto. The whole corner is just... That's the comic book you were asking me about. Oh, that's the one your, your aunt sewed for you? Yeah. You were six years old when you made that? Yeah, we sewed it together to make me like where comic book. That's incredible. <laughs> we also display a lot of main lots of people, which I love, made from the lots of shells. Yep. 
What's with Sarah Fawcett? How does she fit in? Or is she just a, an IT Where are you? You're in Fawcett's, right? Oh, oh, oh Matt yeah. Fawcett. Oh. These are actually quite rare dolls. They're the best collection of these in the world. These are 26 inch made by Dollcraft in 1938. Boy. Again, relating to the um, uh, radio program. And they stopped making them in 1941 and so forth once the war started again. So the dolls are actually pretty rare to find in that kind of condition with well, all the parts and pieces. Wasn't Tonto on TV actually a white man? Um, the Tonto on television was not. He was played by Jay Silverheels. Oh, Jay Silverheels. And Jay Silverheels is yeah. an actual Mohawk Indian. His tribe comes from Ontario uh -huh. and up in New York State. And they yep. do the high iron steelwork and construction on the buildings in New York City. There was a guy who, in the Long Range of Movie Serials named Victor Daniels. Uh -huh. And he came. He went by the movie name of Chief Thundercloud. So he was. He was the white guy. Okay, but Jay that's Silver why I was, was confused. One of yeah. the first Native American actors. Yeah. He, he died in 1980. We can't. We can't forget the Wizard of Oz. What do we got up above here, yeah. John? That's uh, probably the most beautiful Wizard of Oz piece ever done. The artist by J. R. Neal, who did the books after Denslow, did the very first one. And that's the board game open on the ceiling up above. Oh, beautiful yeah. Beautiful artwork, and uh, it's one of the highly collectible Wizard of Oz pieces from 1921. It was made by Parker Brothers in Salem, Mass. My neck of the woods. Yeah. yeah. We got a local Walpole resident who's into Ted Williams, so... This, this bud's for you. This, no, this, is, this, this is bud's for you, for bud. You, bud. Um, but anyway, <laughs> this is... Uh, this is the original, John tells me this is the original patch off his uniform in Korea. Yeah, and, uh, I'm not sure if it's right. So anyway, and then Mike, if he could pan in there, he's got some Ted Williams stuff. So this stuff is not not for sale, but Bud, you could... Uh, there is other stuff that you can is, come in and You can come in and take a, take a look. But anyway, just a little little section of what's going on here. Yeah, well, then they mix it up with some Yankees there. That's terrible. Yeah, they well, <laughs> those, are, those are actually, those are the first bobblehead dolls. Are they? And okay. they're from, this is from 1961 with Maris and Mail. Yeah. And then when they were going for the home run record and there's a Willie Mays in that same time period down mm. here when they were, he was at the San Francisco Giants. Mm. Yeah. But the baseball radio is just fabulous. It's one of my favorite things from the <laughs> 1930s. Wow. Does it get anything but baseball games? Uh, no, and occasionally the Red Sox lose on that too. Uh -oh. I don't know why. The, the <laughs> dial probably says the dial probably says Minnesota Twins, Cleveland yeah. Indians, <laughs> right? When they hit the Cleveland yeah. Indians, then they're going to lose, right? These are uh, radio premium cereal box giveaways, glow in the dark, secret compartment rings, Dakota badges. These are Kellogg's Pep comic character pins. They were given away in the mid 1940s. Uh, for about three years. The most common one of those is Superman. Two of those are actually mine when I was a child. But these are some of the Captain Midnight Dakota badges. There's a Ted Williams <laughs> baseball ring. You see that ball player in there? Oh, yeah. That was given away by Nabisco in 1948. That's right. a shadow blue coal ring. Here are some of the pedometers to see how far you were walking and I so forth. Those, yeah. And then this. Look at these ball. bottle caps. Yeah, but it's with the uh, Cats and Jammer kids. And up here are the original cereal boxes with a Kicks Adam bomb ring. Yeah, you this said that was the most popular toy ever put in a cereal box. Most popular giveaway ever. Uh, and you, you sent in the box top and 25 cents or was it, or 15 cents. Yeah. 15 cents in the box top. And more of those were given away than any other premium ever. Every kid and had to have his Adam common. bomb ring. The, the Adam bomb ring is came out just after we bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki to end the war. And it was given away in the Long Range Radio Program. The ring is common. The rare stuff are the cereal boxes. And those are the things which... How about the salted peanuts, John? What do yeah. we got here? This is a, a, a tin from St. John, New Brunswick with Uncle Wiggly on it. Yeah. And up here is another one of those cereal boxes for Terry and the Pirate's gold detector ring. Oh, man. Uncle well. Wiggly. I, I'm getting emotional because I used to eat my wheat teener out of an Uncle Wiggly bowl. <laughs> So, anyway, so, okay, well, I, I just want to, like, I'm looking at these buttons, because as you know, I collect a few buttons, but, um, where do you find these, John? Um, different around. You can get Yard anything sales you want on whatever. eBay. Yeah, occasionally, but people have a tendency to overvalue them. Superman, you'd think, would be the more expensive one, but it's the most common one. They put that out every year. And that's a full set of all 86. And they're, you know, eBay eBay, eBay, if you want Kellogg's Pep Pins, eBay. They also did a series of uh, World War II insignia pins, and these pins here were given away by uh, 
uh, Quaker Puff Rice and Quaker Puff Wheat, and mm -hmm. they had all the movie stars like Alan Ladd and Ronald Reagan and Betty Hutton and those back in mm. the 1950s. Well, I, I see Mr. Hitler there. Why yeah, would we be is, celebrating this I him? Love. This is. Uh, you got a doll, and you got yeah, that. Well, uh, these are World War II propaganda pieces, okay. and one of the things that. Uh, this is my favorite piece from the war, basically. This was a giveaway. It's called the Five Pigs. So you <laughs> fold up these four pigs here and you make Hitler. Wow. <laughs> and where did that, who, who offered that? How did you I get I have no idea. Yeah, you, wow. can, you, can, you can see the, the hair yeah, is it, right it's there. It's a problem I used to give in my illustration class. I'd That's hand neat. out a Xerox of it and tell them I want you to make your own with it and see what happens. Huh. <laughs> and up there were some of the World War II insignias. These were designed by a man named Hank Porter, who is Disney's best artist. And he did quite a few of these things. From He did over 1,200 military insignias from World War II. Here's a Donald Duck bombardment squadron. This is for the um, Curtis Helldivers off the aircraft carriers in World War II with a big bad wolf. Little Red Riding Hood. And, yeah. Yeah, and up here is the... Uh, uh, from the uh, weather unit up in British Columbia. Disney designed the CB insignia during World War II. That's part of it. And down here you can see a CB uh, car hood ornament, which is pretty neat, I think. Oh, yeah. yeah. From that time period. But these are all World War II propaganda pieces. There, there are matches in here where Hitler's grabbing onto the world, and each match is a bomb. You strike them on his rear end to light them up. I can honestly tell you, I can honestly say, without a doubt, these are the first Hitler dolls I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, right. All right, well, we're going to move into the Roy Rogers room. I'm so excited. It's still going to be the Lone Ranger, no matter how yeah. many times you try to change okay. that. <laughs> I'm getting confused. <laughs> we're finally in the Lone Ranger room, and uh, not the Roy Rogers Lone room. Lone so anyway, this is, this is the Lone <laughs> Ranger frontier town, right, John? Yeah. And remember I mentioned earlier that there was actually a character his name is Brace Beamer, and he was the one who started the Long Ranger on radio, radio. right? Yeah, Beamer uh, was the announcer at the radio station. The original guy who was playing the Long Ranger was killed in a car accident. And so the radio show, they did this whole thing, and Beamer became the Lone Ranger at, in 1941 and played him until the program ended in the late 1950s. There's this his is, hat. Right? Yeah, this is the Lone Ranger's actual hat and mask. That's Brace Beamer's hat and mask here. Beamer is pictured on the cereal boxes in here. That's Beamer. And these are also photographs of Beamer up here. So he was he was on the radio for over 10 years. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah. doing radio shows. And what night was it on? Monday, Wednesday, and Friday night, 7.30. Yeah. Oh. Three times a week. Keep eating those Cheerios. Yeah, Cheerios. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> this is Frontier Town in here. And we're one of the few places that was able to display this thing set up and complete. In 1948, all the Lone Ranger radio programs were done uh, relating to Frontier Town. And Cheyenne, Wyoming actually changed its name to Frontier Town in 48. They took the radio show and the cast out there. And if you had the whole thing all set up, and the Lone Ranger radio program was on, you could sit, follow the Lone Ranger as he went through the Ford or the Indian Village or the train. My mother hated one of these. I had one of these as a kid, and it was always on the dining room table, and she was only yelling at me to get the darn thing down because it was time for supper. So you guys never ate at the dining room table? <laughs> no, they didn't. Mom saw to it, they did. Yeah. Uh, you wore maybe your maybe thing out. Okay, so then it left radio, Didn't went you on have the a TV. Ping pong table? <laughs> went on to TV, yeah, right? Uh, the Lone Ranger started on TV in 1948, and I was really excited. I was eight years old at the time. And I said, oh my god, my favorite program's going on television. And then the thing starts up and they're riding up there and they're shooting the guns and he rides up ah, the cliff and he rears up the horse and all that kind yeah, of stuff. Oh, and then the show came on and I said, boy, this stinks. Now, I agree with you. I, remember, right? I had exactly for, the same this impression. This is for kids. Yeah. And the Lone Ranger radio show was much more adult and mm -hmm. much better. And you, you could use your imagination. Yeah. You know? Were you lucky enough to have your own TV at home? Uh, we had a TV, and uh, I think we were the first people in the neighborhood to get one, and it was about 1948, 47. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I remember that because uh, I think we saw some of the uh, uh, World Series on television at the right. same time. But the thing that was interesting about it was it only came on at 6 o'clock at night, and it went off at midnight, and the last show was always wrestling, so it hadn't changed right, right. over the years. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Killer Kowalski. And yeah, yeah, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, well, we had that. We had the team, and all the kids would come over to my house to watch what we could. Okay, so who who played the Long Ranger at the first first shot at it? 
of a guy named Earl Grasser. Yeah. He raised Beamer on the radio, but the fellow who played him on television is Clayton Moore. There's a uh, yeah, poster picture. of Clayton Moore down here at the bottom. We do have uh, Clayton Moore's shirt and pants here in the museum. There's he, his boot. Clayton Moore did it for a year. Yeah. Now this boot that he's holding over here, this is John Hart's boot. Clayton Moore got into a contract dispute and he, we didn't want to pay him any money, so they they sort of fired Clayton Moore and they hired John Hart to play the Lone Ranger for yeah, a year. He, he was probably asking for something like a thousand dollars an episode, yeah, you know, something maybe, outrageous. Yeah, so yeah. The, probably the night, probably the mo probably the one of the best trivia questions for the Lone Ranger was. Who played the Lone Ranger for one year? <laughs> yeah, that's true. And anyway, he, Hart uh, was also a pretty good movie actor, I think, quite a few movie serials and so forth. There's a picture of John Hart yep. right there. And uh, he's been dying to sit on this saddle. This is a Long Ranger child saddle, right, John? Yeah, this is a, sort of a pony saddle. Yeah. Roy Rogers had one, and Hoppy had one at the same time. And you can see down here on the stirrups the LR and his. his uh, the leg is in the way, but mm -hmm. you can see on this part, well, we'll dismount. where you can uh, see the uh, Lone Ranger <laughs> on this uh, wow. saddle here. Wow. So we're all infatuated with Tonto. Tell us a little bit about Tonto, Jay John. Silverheels. Yeah, this is, uh, this is one of the paintings that was done uh, in about 1948 for the Lone Ranger. And this is what happening when he was on television. Tonto was played on television by an actual Native American. He was a Mohawk Indian. His name was Jay Silverheels. And his tribe came from Upper New York State and also into Ontario, Canada. And they're the uh, people who do the high iron steelwork and construction on the buildings in New York City. Mm -hmm. Silver Hills died in uh, 1980, mm -hmm. but he was one of the very first Native Americans to uh, uh, to actually play an Indian on TV. Now, right above this, John, there's a there's a there's a pennant. Yeah. There's a pennant. Boy, I'll tell you, that's a star-studded. Cast. Filled cast right there. You got the Long Ranger, Tonto, and Lassie. Lassie. In, in one gig. I mean, Jesus. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a rodeo pennant. That would be the kind of thing that they would say have at Boston Garden. Yeah. The kids would go down there, the Lone Ranger would write out Tonto, right. and they'd drag out Lassie with it the same. Okay, so here we got Roy Rogers. Collie, anyway. Roy Rogers shirt. Right? How'd you pick this up, John? This, is, well, this came to his uh, museum in California when his son closed it and moved it to uh, Branson, Missouri. They had an auction. And some of the shirts were going for quite a bit of money. I happened to buy two of them. Gun belts up above, these were done by a man in England by the name of Tony Down. He was really one of the best artists of, uh, you know, working hand Le craft. Leather with, man? Uh, just Boy, a, that is a masterpiece. Incredible. Say, here's another one. This is a that would go good on a motorcycle, wouldn't yeah, it? Huh? This is a Gene Autry, uh, <laughs> Gene Autry holster set up in here. Just beautiful work all over. Boy, when you, come, when you show up at a gunfight, yeah. With a pair of holsters like this, yeah. who the heck wouldn't be scared of you? Yeah. I mean, look at this. Oh boy, I'm not touching him. <laughs> and these are, these are one of the uh, metal signs. They were uh, basically Marita Bread's in the southern part of the uh, country, from uh, Virginia down to Georgia. And there have been a lot of reproductions of these things. So if you see the small ones, they're generally fakes. But this is an mm. original one. You can see how it's they were uh, painted by a man named H.J. Ward for the radio station WXYZ in Detroit because they needed pictures for premiums and giveaways and so forth with the radio show. And Ward was a famous pulp magazine cover artist and uh, he did five of these paintings. I don't know where the other three are. Or I wish I did, but I don't know where they are. So he did stuff for the Green Hornet, Sergeant Preston of the Yukon, and the Lone Ranger. And one of the th he's just one of the best artists around. There's a whole book on his material which has just recently been published, H.J. Ward. If you go to Amazon and just type in H.J. Ward, that'll come up. Get a book on, on, on the on. comic books behind Kit, they yeah. tell a story, right? Sure. They got, there's all kinds of stuff in through here, uh, a lot of the cowboy stuff. I'll, I'll just start by pointing out I'm on the top up here. The um, Up on the top shelf up there is the original Red Rider BB gun box, and these are some original drawings here done by Fred Arman, who is the artist who wrote and drew the Red Rider comic strip. Uh, Harmon was a real cowboy, had a ranch in Pagosa Springs, Colorado, and he considered himself to actually be a Red Rider. And there was a real Indian on the ranch named Little Beaver. Here's a Little Beaver archery set that goes with the Red Rider BB gun. And then down on this shelf in here you can see some of the uh, Red Rider comic books. Now the white 
the main stuff that's kept this thing alive is that Gene Shepard Christmas story movie where Ralphie wants a Daisy Red Ryder to be begun, you'll shoot your eye out and all that kind well, of stuff. runs about 72 hours in a row. Yeah, right. You, you, can't you, know. miss, you can't help to see it. He also had a secret Dakota ring on that one, too. Uh, right? He had a Dakota badge. Hey. Everybody keeps talking Dakota rings. They went, okay. no, Dakota rings. They were okay, badges. badges. Okay. There's only one or two things that had a little Dakota thing on one reason. Well, translated as what, by Ovaltine or something? Yeah, like that's right. That's what he did in the movie. <laughs> but here's Ralphie, a, you know, with his busy red oh, yeah, baby gun. And here's this Fred enough. Harmon here, who's the artist. <laughs> and this is the original Daisy Red Rider BB gun. The way you tell that is. You've got Red Rider on the wooden stock over here. Right. There's a wooden grip up on the front, and on the front of that is a copper band, and up here on the end of the muzzle is a copper band, and that's how you tell the original Dead Red yeah. Rider BB gun. So classic. Yeah, Red Rider is. Uh, there's a couple of right behind uh, Kit over here is a couple of Red Rider comic books. These are the very first ones that were ever done. Red Rider on the top and Cracker Jack Funnies down here, 1938. So ten first, cents. I remember paying ten cents for those. Red Rider in the yeah. comics, yeah. How much the comic cost now? Uh, boy, they get up to five bucks or more. They keep putting out these the yes. thing they call trade paperbacks and so mm -hmm. forth. We had to come back. Kent's infatuated with the Jeep story, and it is an unbelievable story. Jeep was Popeye's companion. Uh, yeah, he really. was he was actually given to him. He's an African uh, African animal. And they were shipped to Popeye in a box. And up here is the very first appearance of the Jeep in the Sunday Funnies in 1936. And the Jeep couldn't tell a lie. See? And Wimpy would take him off to the racetrack, and then he would say, is horse number six going to win? And he'd figure out which horse was going to win, and he'd bet on that. But anyway, it's the Jeep, and there's a bunch of them down in here. They're very, very collectible images, and they're very hard to find. You can see some more in the background in there. Um, this animal is the one that the soldiers in the Second World War named their general purpose vehicles after, GP vehicles. Mm -hmm. So if you're driving a Jeep car, it's named after a character in Popeye. Yeah, amazing. There's your story for the okay, day. So we, John is very proud of his fifth and sixth grade artwork. So John, this is, I mean, this, this is John up here in the fifth and sixth grade, right? Yeah, that's the uh, James Russell Lowell School in Watertown, Massachusetts, and these were the PTA poster contest. The one first prize both years. I shouldn't have won this year because I copied that Cisco Kid comic book cover. Uh, plagiarism. Oh, yeah, okay. I know. Hope, hope, don't get, hope you don't get. Hope you don't get sued one, because of it. Yeah, that one's one of mine. And then and this the, paper yeah, figure. Yeah, these beautiful. Are, these are World War II paper toys in 1942. The government put out an order, you can't use anything in toys we need for the war. And all the toys became paper, cardboard, and wood. And so these sold for 10 cents in the original package, and you punched out these paper toys. I didn't have 10 cents. I used to make my own paper toys at the time. As you can see, Little Orphan Annie, they're wearing military uniforms down here. Terry and the Pirates, military uniforms. And this, is, this one always gets me. This is a Captain Marvel buzz bomb. Now, we didn't have the buzz bomb. The Germans had right, the buzz bomb. Right. That was the one they were dropping on London. London. But here you could have your own little buzz bomb at home and blow up anybody in your neighborhood that mm -hmm. you wanted to if you had that. Or drive court. your parents crazy. Yeah, drive your paper crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just about out of time here. My friend Mickey's saying goodbye. And we wanted uh, John to let us know. What are your hours now, John? Yeah, we're open essentially five days a week. We are always shut on Tuesday and Wednesday. And we open the building at 10. And we do close the building at 4. So I always say, arrive for the museum before 3 at least. Because oh, you'll be yeah. in here for an hour. And if you come early, many times at 10 o'clock, I can even give you a tour of what's going on if in the building. If you catch John in a good mood like he yeah. is today, <laughs> yeah. then you He's can always get a, in a good mood. Yeah, then you can get a special, uh, special knowledgeable yeah, it, tour. And I, it's also a museum that is best enjoyed by parents and grandparents and people who can remember some of the stuff from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Mm -hmm. And if you bring the kids, I've seen kids go in here and not know what they're looking at and they'll be dragging the parents out with them so yeah put the, it really is an adult museum well they want yeah. their handheld you know yeah. they don't put really. the put the kids in a kennel and just bring the parents yeah. up and have a good time and also you should mention it's an extremely reasonable five dollars oh yeah we've so, got so. i i think uh, i've been holding now for the last six years at a five dollar admission fee and that's for everybody uh anybody who's walking can cost five bucks um and that we have 
probably twice as much for you to see as you would at the major museums and they were all 10 and 12 bucks admission so yeah. twice as much to see and at less than half the price in many cases and uh, uh, Yankee Magazine at one point uh, has awarded us their Best of New England award as something you shouldn't miss in Maine. So we're on Route 1, three miles north of Moody Steiner on the left hand side. And uh, come and enjoy. Website, John? Yeah, website, just Google Maine Antique Toy and Art Museum. And the website will come up. And on that website, uh, there are some links in there to some of my Facebook pages where you can see over 200 photographs of stuff that was in the museum. A lot of pictures of you there too. Actually. Yeah, well, those are the <laughs> those are the Facebook faces that are on there. Uh, thanks for your time, and uh, definitely come and check this place out. Well, definitely.